Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Duzo Yoroshiko Onigasamas, Ohio Kosasimas. First of all, um, thank you to MIC for hosting this initiative and to Dr. Tim Kelly for inviting Climate Risk to attend. Uh, we met uh, Dr. Kelly at the UNF C talks in Bali last uh, December, and we welcome further dialogue and opportunities to help ICT sector capture benefits and opportunities from climate change. Today, I'll give you a quick overview about climate risk and our approach, then get in to some work that we've published last year. Uh, climate Risk is composed of three companies. Uh, we're based in Sydney and Brisbane in Australia uh, and in London. Um, we work beyond compliance, so we don't, we don't do CR, CSR at all. Uh, we work uh, in the opportunity space. We don't do public relations, and we don't do greening. We work solely on risk. Uh, we work with large corporations uh, in the insurance sector, such as Zurich Financial Services, uh, state and local government, sovereign governments, fund managers, and the broader investment community. Um, our legacy is in infrastructure development, in energy generation and distribution, fixed and wireless telecoms, broadcasting and satellite, utilities, applied climatology, and climate policy. Uh, we've worked with a diverse range of companies, uh, some of which have been mentioned today, and I've done some work with Japanese companies, Tomen, and uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company. Our staff have worked in a diverse range of situations from disaster relief in Gujarat, uh, development of energy technology, academic research, and board and CEO coaching on climate strategy. For every client, we carry out an independent risk assessment before we start any work. I just want to introduce the concept of the risks that climate change uh, pose to business. If you're not compliant, you're going to go to jail. If you're not compliant, your customers are going to leave you. So we expect all our, all our customers, uh, our business customers, to be compliant as a minimum. Most of our business looks at the opportunities that climate change present, and that puts us in a very different place from most other consulting businesses. Carbon might not be a significant issue, and it's very important to understand the materiality of carbon in your climate strategy. Um, we work with helping our clients understand the risks, avoid risks, transfer the risks, and manage the risks before opportunity. And carbon cost, might, you might be able to pass that on to your customer. There's a copy of this presentation available on the, on the web. We were commissioned by Telstra, which is Australia's largest telecommunications company, and also largest occupier of buildings, and also the largest vehicle fleet in Australia, uh, to look at uh, how telecommunications networks, uh, in particular teleworking, uh, might benefit. As part of our independent risk assessment, we realized that there are a lot more opportunities than simple teleworking. And we've produced a report again, which is avail available uh, from the web. It's open source and peer reviewed, so we welcome critical comment. And today, I've also provided you with a copy of Telstra's response. So what we're looking at and what makes us different is we look at how telecoms can actually address national climate issues. So rather than just getting your house in order, we look at a way of actually making money from climate change. We start with looking at the local situation. So this is Australia's emission trends based on uh, existing government policies. We use a method called uh, Sokolo uh, Wedge uh, approach, which is based on Robert Sokolo's work at MIT. Um, it's essentially stochastic modeling using near-term technology, so available technology to provide solutions. The uh, description on the left-hand side of the graph is different policy measures by the Australian governments. 
the graph itself shows uh, reductions in emissions as a result of policies. You can see clearly that Australia's position is showing high growth rates in CO2 emissions. The UK Financial Times has described our work as audacious, but we think it's time that business uh, started looking at opportunities in climate rather than just reacting to a, a, green, a green movement. We show here in this graph that Australia's net emissions can be reduced by 5% using the telecommu telecommunications opportunities as set out in our uh, document. This would allow Australia to uh, achieve stabilisation of emissions and equate to a 5% reduction. Uh, the business press in Australia have also been very critical uh, about our, some of our work, uh, describing us as a network solution looking for a problem. And that's exactly what we are. We're getting our clients to look uh, look for the problem, the problem climate change, and the solution is IT. So we've started looking at the different sectors in the Australian emission profile and where IT might be able to attack and, and actually benefit both the company, Telstra, and the consumer, the end consumer. So we've targeted the production of energy, which in Australia is based on coal, and the transport sectors as the two highest uh, sectors where telecommunications can make a meaningful uh, reduction. Yeah. As you see, some of the problems in Australia, 90% of our electricity come from fossil fuels. 10% of household and office electricity is currently wasted by devices. 15% of office and home electricity is wasted by appliances being on but not being used. 75% of Australians drive to work, representing 8% of national emissions. One third of all freight kilometers are empty. We have a lot of large vehicles on our roads that are empty. And about half of our air travel in Australia is for business and growing at an increasing rate. So we assembled a, uh, a team of internal uh, staff and a technical review board of a, a independent uh, scientists and uh, representation from some peak bodies to review our work. We were able to show basically that uh, the biggest impact of telecommunications was on the penetration of renewable energy. So that's using the principle of demand response to match the variable loads generated from renewable sources. In Australia's case, mostly from wind and from some solar. So this is moving beyond demand management and looking at the ability of actually matching the variable wind load to d demand across a wide area using telecommunications, either copper or uh, wireless, to uh, do the control function. We heard about telepresencing this morning and we've shown some 2.4 megatons CO2 equivalent can be abated. Um, these figures are all conservative. They're based on published data provided by independent sources. And we've deliberately been conservative. Um, but you can see here that 2.4 megatons is a significant reduction. These are annual figures to 2015. The remote appliance power management um, is a technology application which allows individual device level control. And I'm pleased to see NIT uh, C, showing similar technology here uh, today as we've got in Australia. Presence-based power is using near-field communication devices. And we're going to hear from Nokia, who are one of the experts in the application of near-field uh, communications soon. The decentralized business district is uh, essentially setting up uh, smart suites, smart office suites, outside the uh, current business uh, uh, centers in Australia and there's both property and uh, transport benefits from that. Um, personalized public transport is important. We don't do work on uh, private transport. Uh, the, one of the previous presenters mentioned Jevon's paradox. It's very important if you focus on private transport, 
you simply drive up the utility or the use of private transport. What we need to do is move to public bums on seats in public transport. And finally, the real-time freight management. So that's connecting freight loads to empty vehicles. And there's a big role for um, IT uh, to uh, commercialize uh, near-field uh, uh, technologies. We've made some ads up just to give you a principle, uh, an idea of, um, of the uh, applications. And I also think it's quite ironic that I've flown from Australia uh, to present for one hour. Uh, when, of course, we have some of these technologies already available. You'll see the telepresencing suite, which, having used it, is quite amazing. And uh, Cisco have been very successful uh, in Australia with some of the larger corporations. In, uh, in Australia, if your corporation flies more than 80 flights per month, the technology will pay itself off in under a year, which is fairly considerable return on investment. And that's on time alone, not, al not including carbon or uh, the flight costs. Sorry. Uh, this is to highlight the concept of personalized public transport. Uh, you'll see some trials in Europe, um, Nokia running trials showing uh, e-tickets, e-booking, and um, uh, real-time travel information. Um, we've looked at a trial in Australia using uh, minibuses and large taxi fleets for shared rides. Again, getting people quickly into the city uh, and sharing vehicles rather than private vehicles. Sorry. Technology failure. Very important to remember. Okay, I want to focus on renewable energy. Um, renewable energy growth is being constrained in many markets by the network's ability to manage variable load. So in some cases, and in fact, Japanese developers in Australia are having their investments uh, restricted by either the availability of grid or by network management itself. Wind and solar, natural sources of energy, can be, very ver uh, can be variable, and we find a way of matching that variable load to wide area networks. So what we're showing here is the ability to use the concept of virtual energy storage. This room is a form of energy storage at the moment. Uh, most buildings can uh, be, a, be a source of energy storage. And we're suggesting that the telecommunications networks can become more aggressive and take over the network management role of energy companies. You will find that the mobile networks or the copper networks cover more country than the energy networks. The legacy billing systems within uh, cellular or mobile companies are younger than uh, energy companies. And there's an opportunity both for uh, metrology in terms of metering, billing, uh, network management, power management, and um, uh, a virtual utility operation by, by the telco operators. Um, this creates some $86 million of saving and between $100 and $300 million of carbon benefit. And the important thing to realize is the design of regulation and policy is very important. If you're not sitting at the table representing telecom, you're on the menu because I know every, other, every one of my clients is currently influencing and affecting policy. So if the telecommunications sector doesn't uh, communicate its opportunities and benefits, under a carbon-constrained world, you're going to lose those advantages to, c to competing sectors. So this is in uh, billions of dollars. You can multiply by, I think, 95 yen to the dollar uh, to get the uh, yen equivalent. Um, you can see here that the video conferencing presents the biggest saving to the customer, highlighted in green. And the carbon benefit, the highest carbon benefit is the renewable energy penetration. There's also uh, opportunity to sell energy at the top of the 
uh, demand cycle uh, using the telecommunications network management. And that, in Australia, can increase the, the price paid for energy by uh, 10,000 fold, which is a substantial opportunity. Um, and again, just reiterating, this is the net effect if uh, a conservative number of these opportunities was implemented, a stabilization of Australia's national emissions target. So what are the lessons? Um, our view is that um, telecommunications can be a major player in carbon, but you need to be sending the right message to policy and market uh, designers. If you, if you don't get your clear message across, then the attribution, the benefits of that carbon, flows to other parties in the market. Telecommunications can provide disruptive solutions in other sectors. So be open to future applications as well as current applications. And your impact could be a lot bigger. We think in some cases some four times the current uh, emissions reduction. And we're going to hear this afternoon on adaptation. We've done a lot of work in developing markets around telecom applications for climate adaptation. We're looking at a trial in Zambia at the moment for using uh, micro-insurance delivered over the mobile platform and weather and climate data captured back over the mobile back into um, the, uh, a, weather risk, uh, a weather risk function. So there's a lot of applications. Uh, you just need to spend time and money understanding how those may be applied and then have the ability to communicate to your, your governments and regulators. Thank you very much.